What a whirlwind for Canadian soccer. Two cancelled men's games, a player boycott, and some tense moments in the media. Things appear to be patched up for now between the Canadian Soccer Association and the men's national team. In a week where nothing was certain, Canada Soccer confirmed upcoming Nations League games wouldn't be affected after news of talks between administrators and the men's team. But it's not over. The players still have to agree to a revenue sharing deal and we're no closer to learning who or what will change to make that happen. So let's take a step back and ask Chris Jones, who covers the men's national team for CBC Sports, about what drove the players to this point. Chris, what happened? <laughs> what happened? Uh, that's a really good question. Last week, I wrote a story about how Canada scheduled a friendly game against Iran after that game got canceled because there was such an outcry about it that maybe finally Canada soccer has reached a point of accountability that this, this is the fiasco that's big enough to finally course correct within the institution. Little did I know <laughs> that after rescheduling the game against Panama, that the players were then going to go on strike and not play. I mean, it, it's, it's like the Iran fiasco, which was legitimately a debacle, was the tip of the iceberg. And now the monster that has lived under the bed at Canada Soccer for years has finally come out. Normally, when things operate well, these contracts are established even at the start of qualifying. Uh, for Qatar in 2022, they get $10 million, a windfall. But there's no rules, there's no standard rule for how countries use that, that prize money. Some federations keep all of it. Some federations give most of it to the players. Canada does not currently have a contract for either its men or its women what to do with World Cup prize money. Qualifications seem feasible for months, so in theory, the amount of money earmarked for the players could have been negotiated in advance. So another thorn in this, another tricky sort of part of this negotiation is that the men have asked for 40% and in their sort of Dear Canada letter that they offered over the weekend when they explained why they weren't playing, they said we would like uh, the women's team to get the same percentage. Well, the problem here is that FIFA gives dramatically different prize money for the men and the women. So uh, in 2022, the Men's World Cup, all of the teams combined will get about 400 and I believe it's $440 million. And in the Women's World Cup next year, they're getting about $60 million. So FIFA is inequitable in terms of the money that comes to the men and the women. And the women, they wouldn't accept an equal percentage, but they want equal money, like absolute dollars equal, uh, which will require another level of negotiation, possibly between the men and the women. So again, how to figure this out in this amount of time, I think it's just, it's a really tall order. It's the last thing you want to be doing six months outside of a World Cup. Both national teams have also complained that transparency is a big issue in these negotiations. Canada soccer to me has not been transparent enough in where the money comes from and where the money goes. It's a public organization, I guess federal funding. Like I don't understand how you can sort of be secretive about this. There's this really strange contract with Canadian soccer business it's called, which is a private entity that also runs the Canadian Premier League. This contract was signed in 2018, it's a 10 year deal. Nick Bonta said that the revenue from that deal has kept Canada soccer afloat through the pandemic. But now it seems like, you know, the terms of the landscape has changed. 2018, the idea that Canada's men would qualify for this World Cup seemed pretty remote. And now here we are and where that money is coming from, where that money is going, no one seems to know. I mean, the players themselves have said they don't understand the terms. The lack of transparency, the lack of really forthright answers to me is is a, it's a public issue right now. This is not a sports issue. This is an issue of governance. This is an issue of good government. And I, I really think that Canada soccer has a lot of questions that they need to answer and they're not answering them. Okay, so what's the situation with the women's team? For that, we turn to senior contributor Shireen Ahmed, who has long covered equal pay for equal play. Canada soccer's multiple fiascos over the last few days have made it clear that the men are playing catch up to the women both on and off the field. That's because the women's contractual issues date back to at least January and their public issues with the administration go back years. They too are critical of where the CSA puts its money and thereafter what you could argue is the minimum that they're entitled to. The Olympic gold medalists want not just FIFA percentages, 
but salaries, benefits, and social supports that match the men's side. Diana Matheson has been very open about how the CSA needs to step up and create better earning opportunities and financial support for the women's side. And now it's the active player's turn, once again, to speak up. They have also been public advocates for survivors of abuse at the hands of the Federation. Looking at you and WSL and former under 20 Canadian women's coach, Bob Berarda. But back to pay equality. What they've been looking for has been done south of the border. Earlier this year, the U.S. Soccer Federation and the Players Unions signed on to collective bargaining agreements that promised identical pay. It means that the money earned by each team is pooled and split. That's for every game, whether it's a friendly or World Cup appearance, the same bonuses, the same pay for days spent in training camp, World Cup prize money, the same commercial revenue payouts. This World Cup cycle, the split is 45-45-10 between the two teams and U.S. soccer. And come 2026, it'll be 40-40-20. That kind of action leaves one thinking whether a leader like Cindy Parlo Cohn, former U.S. women's national team player and current USSF president, may just be the type of acting president that is required for the CSA. Someone who understands the needs of the players and the culture around the teams. A leader who can communicate and is intentional with their actions. Perhaps the old boys in the boardroom are not what's needed for elite first teams that have brought Canadian soccer to the world stage in an unprecedented manner. While the Canadian men's national team did call for an equitable structure with the women's team, the Canadian women's national team responded as well to the letter. And while they have been negotiating in good faith, they made some clarifications for their counterparts. It is unclear whether the men's team consulted the women's team, but the inclusion and recognition of the women's side are important. Arguably, it is not something that Canadian soccer has seen before, the men's team supporting the women so publicly. The men's next and final window of international friendlies is in September, while the women play Korea in a friendly at the end of June before their World Cup and Olympic qualifying begin in July.